Hey guys, Woodruff here. So we've been going over heart failure. This is a part of my longer lecture. Um, and this specific one is going to be over treatment, specifically medical treatment. I'll have to do a different video on the nursing focus. So you have to think about, there's a lot of different problems going on here, but effectively my goal for a patient with heart failure is I want their heart to not have to work so hard. I don't want it to be so stressed out. I want to decrease the workload. I want it to pump better. Um, I want to deal with this fluid issue that I have and pretty much prevent their heart from being too stressed out. So we can do medications. I'm um, probably the most, um, uh, what do you call it? The, the medication you're going to, the type of medication that's going to be the most helpful for this patient, let me put it that way, is going to be a positive inotrope. Now we talk about digoxin. I'll tell you in real life, we don't use digoxin as much as we used to because it's very toxic. Um, there's other positive inotropes that we may use or other medications, but there you're still going to see some patients on digoxin. And because it's dangerous, you know, um, NCLEX and other uh, things, other people in nursing school, we love to teach all about the danger zones. So, um, positive inotropes. And remember, if you don't, if, or if you don't know, positive inotropes are medications that help the part contract or pump, um, better moving things forward. Um, we also want uh, medications to decrease the workload of the heart. So this is going to be things like if there's a lot of fluid on my heart, it can't pump as well because it's so full and there's not enough space. So, um, decreasing the amount of fluid on my body, my heart is going to help to decrease the workload of the heart. So diuretics, then remember, um, this is where it's going to be different. So a lot of students get this confused. So like ACEs and ARBs and beta blockers, most people are like, Ooh, I know, I know this is to decrease the, um, uh, what do you call it? The patient's blood pressure. We do not give uh, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers to decrease blood pressure. Now, in a, it will help. And in the beginning, when someone is new um, in their heart failure, they are going to have um, usually a higher blood pressure. Um, it's, there's all that resistance. Remember, the sympathetic nervous system is activated. It's working hard. But as time goes on, their blood pressure goes down. So I'm not giving this hoping that they're going to be less hypertensive, but I want to decrease all the things that are stressing the heart out. What stresses the heart? Out, having too much fluid in um, sodium and constriction in the blood vessels. So if I can use ACE inhibitors, I'm blocking that RAS stimulation we talked about where the body's trying to compensate. So really think I'm decreasing the workload of the heart by stopping the compensation. My body's trying to help. It's making things worse. The, as long as the RAS system is going on, I have more sodium, more fluid, more constriction in my blood vessels. And this is not good. So I need to block that. And then same with beta blockers. Remember, they also decrease the resistance in the blood vessels but on top of that, they increase my heart rate. I'm in fight or flight. My, if I'm in fight or flight and my heart is already sick, how hard is that going to be for it to pump? So we give beta blockers um, in order to help to, um, what do you call it, decrease that heart rate so the heart's not working so hard. And so there's more time for filling as well. Um, so this is going to help to um, decrease the workload. So I would definitely review and go back to my diuretics video that I had for hypertension, where it talks about diuretics. How does it help heart failure versus in, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, hypertension versus heart failure. Um, cause it's different. Like I'm trying to treat a symptom for heart failure. I'm trying to treat their shortness of breath. I'm trying to treat this extra workload. Whereas, um, for hypertension, obviously I'm just trying to treat that number and get that pressure down. Um, and same with ACEs and ARBs. I'm in and, and, and hypertension. I'm trying to get their blood pressure down here. I'm trying to uh, decrease their heart rate. I'm trying to decrease this workload on their heart, less fluid retention, less sodium retention, um, and then um, less sympathetic nervous system, um, you know, uh, uh, activation because it's making it too hard. My heart's in fight or flight mode all the time. It cannot survive. Um, there's other things, um, like I already mentioned, ACEs and ARBs can decrease resistance in the blood vessels. I know most of the time when I talk about ACEs and ARBs, I talk about the fluid and the sodium, but they also cause constriction in the blood vessels. Um, but the other thing we can use is vasodilators. Um, so sometimes these are needed in order to help to relax um, the blood vessels so that heart the heart can pump without as much resistance. Um, other things we can do is manage other condi conditions. So if they have hypertension, and that is a problem, we will manage that. Um, if they have angina, coronary artery disease, or decreased flow, plaque issues, we need to treat those. So we want to do whatever we can to get good flow to the heart, less resistance, less fluid. Um, and then dysrhythmias, like I mentioned, um, the, the patients with um, heart failure are going to be higher risk for being an AFib. 
Um, they're also going to be pooling blood, even if they're not an AFib. So they are higher risk where you would think, huh, all patients are going to need to be, all heart failure patients are going to need to be on anticoagulants. They're going to be on antiplatelets most likely, um, but the patients with heart failure that need anticoagulation are going to be those that are an AFib and those that have a lower ejection fraction. Um, the other things you want to consider is, um, uh, like I said, we want to do whatever we can to decrease the stress on the heart. So we don't want hot and cold extremes. We don't want emotional stressors, like things like if they're, they should not go through nursing school with heart failure. Um, oxygen, because remember the supply demand thing, if I have less um, supply or an increased demand, which I would have, an, I would have both for heart failure, um, I might need more oxygen. Then um, these people are not gonna handle being sick. They need to be vaccinated. They need to um, to protect themselves. Uh, and again, it doesn't stop them from getting sick, but it stops them as from dying as easily from when they get sick and then teaching hygiene education. And there is, we talked a little bit when we talked about pacemakers, there's the like biventricular pacemaker, which the heart can get a little out of sync. So um, these help to get them more in sync. Let's try again. Come on, there we go. Um, so positive inotropes, um, this is the one med that we need to discuss. Probably for my actual lecture class, I'm going to add a slide what I just explained about the meds and how we know they help. But, you know, we actually do an activity in class that might, um, you know, that might be a little bit more helpful. But we'll, we'll um, you know, just keep in mind, you know, I have other videos that go deeper into some of these meds and stuff like that. Um, but um, when I'm talking about like how beta blockers and ACEs help in heart failure versus hypertension, but you definitely want to know your difference. So when you're on a question that's asking you, hey, you're giving this med, how will you know it's effective for this type of patient? You just want to make sure you know, like, how do I know it worked? How do I know there's a problem? So I might add a slide later. So if you're sitting here and you're like, wait, in class, there was a different slide. Um, that's why. Um, but I'm not changing this slide, this slide you need to know. So let's talk about digoxin. Like I said, this is not used as often as what it, we may make it seem, but um, so there is a good handful of patients that are still going to be on it. This is not one of those that I'm like, like Theophylline that I'm like, we never use it. We do use digoxin. Um, I've given this, you know, multiple times in the last year. Not, it's not a common, but multiple times. Um, so how do we know digoxin has worked? It's a positive inotrope. So again, it's going to help with my heart squeeze, or you can think of it like this, the rope squeezing around the heart. It worked if I have better cardiac output, if I'm showing signs of better perfusion, especially think of like kidney function, things like that. Um, but how will I know there's a problem? So like I mentioned, this is a toxic medication. When I say toxic, go back to everything I talked about therapeutic levels. So when I talked about therapeutic levels, when it comes to... Um, uh, therapeutic levels of um, like, you know, the PTT and INR and stuff like that. We want to think of the same things here um, where we want to keep it in this range. Like if it's too low, it's not going to be enough to give them the medication and they're going to, um, the medication, the point of the medication or enough of the medication to do a good job. And if I'm not, if I don't have enough of this medication, what happens? Well, then I'm going to have less heart squeeze. And then I'm going to have an issue with, um, poor cardiac output and perfusion. But on the other end, it also can get really toxic. So if I have, there's too much of a good thing. So I need it enough in this like range where it's enough to help my heart to squeeze, but not so much that it gets toxic. Cause you, um, something you might not know about digoxin is it does three things. It can be used in a lot of different ways. So digoxin can be used for heart failure as a positive inotrope, which again is the heart squeeze. It also can be used in atrial fibrillation as a negative chronotrope and dromotrope, which means it decreases my heart rate and it also decreases my electrical activity. So um, it's what we, um, you know, like it, uh, if I'm an AFib, it can decrease that activity. So um, when I've given digoxin in the last year, it's always been for AFib. It's never been, well, maybe once for heart failure, but usually it's always for AFib. So um, if I, um, if you think, if you know that it works this way, so what this is going to do, it's going to increase the squeeze of my heart, like how much is pumping um, out, how strong my heart is. It's going to increase that, but it's going to decrease my heart rate. And it's also going to decrease the electrical activity in my heart. If I have too much of it, what is going to happen? Well, the really late things are going to be heart block, severe bradycardia. Because if I have too much of something that brings my heart down, the severe symptoms of that is going to be a really low heart rate. Um, you do want to know the difference between early and late symptoms as we're getting up here. And your textbook says something like 
Ideally, we want to keep it around 0.8. Don't worry, disregard that. Just know this therapeutic 0.5 to 2. Um, don't get too crazy in your head because you're not a practitioner. You don't need to know perfect research, but we just look at general therapeutic range. Um, but know these differences early and late. So early, they would actually have GI symptoms and a strain, usually early symptoms are less serious symptoms, but for whatever reason, early and um, for this, they can have vision changes and see yellow halos around everything they're seeing. That's an early sign that this they've had too much. So of course, if I have medicine that lowers your blood pressure and your pulse, I want to check those before. And this is going to be just like beta blockers where I'm going to hold it if the heart rate is less than 60. Um, the other thing to consider is potassium. So potassium and digoxin have an inverse relationship. So in other words, if my potassium is low, then I'm going to be more likely to have um, an increase or toxic digoxin level. Whereas if my potassium is high, it's actually going to drive a lower digoxin level. Um, and that's like, when I say digoxin level, I mean how much digoxin is in the system. So that's going to make it where it's not therapeutic. So because it works this way, we have to be concerned because we have to think about what other meds are these patients on. They're usually on digoxin and they're on diuretics. And so if they're on both of those, what do what did we learn diuretics do? They either hold on to potassium or they waste potassium. Um, and so as a result, um, what you want to think about here is that um, there's going to be a real big issue if I don't check a potassium before. And uh, for like something you could have a question about or a scenario you want to think about is if I have a patient that has a... Um, a low potassium, like I checked their potassium before, and let's say it's like mm, 2.9, I am not going to give my digoxin. That is not safe. If that potassium is already low and I give that digoxin, it's going to even increase the um, how therapeutic my digoxin is and make it toxic. Um, and so uh, that's more we worried about. Don't get too in your head about the high potassium, less therapeutic. Usually when questions are asked about this, they want to see that a low potassium is, is not okay to give the digoxin at the same time. All right. I think that's all for medical treatments. And I think the last video will be all about nursing interventions and nursing management. I'll see you for that one.